If you turn on the daytime talk shows or accidentally get a look at the sort of magazines they sell at grocery stores, you'll be assaulted by the most horrendous slop. What the royals are up to. William, this, his grumpy kid or whatever that, Netflix deal with what's-her-face. America, get your act together. We fought and won a war about this. But what if we didn't? What if America lost the Revolutionary War and remained part of the British Empire? Well, this is what, why, how, and that's what the video is about. If you like this sort of video, subscribe. Okay, let's rewind time back to September 1777 into the early phase of the Revolutionary War. A British army under the command of John Burgoyne is marching down the Hudson River. Ultimately, he plans to seize control of Albany and split New England from Virginia, possibly destroying the Fresh Revolution. Poised against him is an American army under Horatio Gates, which marches north and builds fortifications at a place called Bemis Heights. As the British army stumbles and staggers south, the Americans have to decide what to do. On September 19th, Benedict Arnold, not yet a traitor, suggests Horatio Gates march forward and confront the Redcoats. But Horatio Gates hates Benedict Arnold and doesn't much like his ideas. After several hours of arguing though, Gates gives in and the two armies clash in a farm. After a day of vicious fighting, the Americans withdraw, but the Brits are so bloodied they lose the campaign. After a few more battles, Burgoyne surrenders and the bruised Brits are locked away until the end of the war. This victory, the Battles of Saratoga, raised such a din that France caught wind of it and decided that us Americans could actually beat Britain. They soon joined the war and British defeat was thereafter basically inevitable. But what if Saratoga went differently? What if the Americans lost? Well, there's a few ways that could have happened. Horatio Gates, a stubborn guy, could have just ignored Benedict Arnold and kept behind his fortifications. The British would then have marched south with their full strength and seized a convenient elevated area to the Americans' west where they could bombard them to dust with superior artillery. Or, if Benedict Arnold won the argument anyways, the British could have won if they got their act together and concentrated their army at its center rather than marching south in three columns. In real life, one of the columns basically got lost on the way to the battle. Now, I'm not pulling this stuff out of my ass, historians have brought up these mistakes before. Okay, so let's say the Brits win the Battle of Saratoga. They capture the Americans and ship them off to some horrible prison, then soon afterward capture Albany, New York. Meanwhile, the Redcoats win the Battle of Brandywine and occupy Philadelphia like real life. The rebels enter the winter with dangerously low morale. In 1778, Britain is able to focus its full might on crushing the rebellion since it's not distracted by pesky France. Over the next several campaign seasons, Britain wipes up the rebels. Some American leaders are tried in England, but others like Washington and Jefferson find refuge in France, but the rebellion is defeated. For the next 15 years, the American colonies face strict rule by Britain as punishment for their insurrection. In the face of a second looming revolution, Britain passes the Reform Bill which splits its colonies into several provinces, each headed by a lieutenant governor but given some legislative autonomy. These divisions will last a long time. What won't last a long time is Britain's peace with France. War soon erupts over some Caribbean sugar islands. After years of expensive fighting, the war ends in a stalemate, but France is bankrupt. The fiscal crisis and an inconvenient famine turns into revolution. While the French revolutionaries don't have an independent United States to inspire them, they do have Jefferson and Washington and of course their own great thinkers and great demagogues like everyone's favorite Corsican. Europe erupts into another generation of bloodshed. With a little extra American help, the coalition might beat Napoleon sooner, but I wouldn't be so sure it makes much of a difference. Back in America, Louisiana has raised the tricolor of France, so American loyalists invade and capture New Orleans. Louisiana becomes a British colony. After the war, millions of Englishmen, Irishmen, Germans, and others flee the devastation to the pristine shores of the American colonies. With the increasing population pressure of these immigrants, Britain relents and allows the settlement of the Midwest. When native tribes like the Iroquois resist their deportation, they're confronted with armed force by militias, settlers, and if they fight back too hard, redcoats too. So the British Empire is dragged forward inch by inch. But that's hardly the toughest obstacle Britain faces. Abolitionism is spiking in the British Isles. The largest supporter of slavery, though, is the Southern Colony, because slavery is a booming industry in the cotton-growing South. 
In 1835, the British Parliament passes the Slavery Abolition Act. Even though it offers compensation and a buffer period of 10 years, the Chesapeake and Southern colonies ragefully rebel. Uh, there's also Canada that joins in just for fun. The others remain loyal, though. English and American redcoats, after some setbacks, crush the rebellion. Afterward, Britain appoints the immensely rich Lord Durham as the Governor General of British North America and asks him how to get the odious Americans in line. He recommends unifying all the different colonies and giving America a responsible government, kind of like a democracy. Britain rejects his suggestions and drags its fancy leather boots for another 10 years before growing pressure from Republican leagues in America convinces it to pass the North America Act of 1847. All the British American colonies are swept into one single government, the Dominion of America, with its capital in New York. While the Prime Minister and Legislature of America have plenty of power, the Governor General, appointed by Britain, is the Chief Executive. This fragile union, which ties together the French-speaking Quebecois, New York merchants and resentful southern plantation owners, not least to mention a bunch of Native Americans and recently freed slaves, doesn't have much of a national identity. While sometimes more trouble than it's worth, the Dominion of America does add to Britain's already gargantuan ability to project its power abroad. Anglo-American businesses gain immense power in Latin American countries, for example, especially Mexico. Also, there's Texas, which is ostensibly a patriotic Republican stronghold against British authoritarianism, but in actuality, a British puppet. So when conflict erupts between Mexico and Texas in 1858, the Dominion rushes to its aid, beats Mexico in a war, and annexes California. Over the second half of the 1800s, Britain uses America as a stepping stone to new lands. It gobbles up Alaska, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and of course lucrative treaty ports in China. There is also, of course, India, and soon enough a massive chunk of Africa too. Families from these impoverished places are shipped off to British colonies, including America, to work as indentured laborers. Back in the early 1800s, Britain fought a desperate war against Napoleonic France, which sought to conquer Europe. A century later, power in Europe is held instead by Austria. When France seizes control of Morocco, Austria invades, and Britain comes to the aid of its old nemesis. Eight years of trench warfare follow, with Americans contributing immensely to the war effort. Britain and its allies win the war, breaking apart Austria. The soldiers of this great war bring home a renewed sense of patriotism. African and Indian American soldiers demand equal rights to their white neighbors, beginning the civil rights movement. Politicians request greater independence from Britain too. Deeply indebted to the Dominion of America, Britain agrees. In 1922, it gains nearly complete independence as the Commonwealth of America. However, America and Britain are still close allies. When Austria attempts to restore its empire in the 1930s, the Americans come to the aid of Britain right off the bat. Because of this, the European War ends quickly, and Britain, America, France, and Russia craft a new world order. Over the next decades, America struggles not for independence, but with independence. The wartime feelings of unity and patriotism fade quickly as attention is focused on the cultural differences between the provinces of the massive commonwealth. The next generation identifies more so with the socialism promoted by the Russian Republic than the parliamentary monarchy of their parents. There's also the question of civil rights, with the South nearly leaving the Commonwealth as the federal government enforces voting rights for minorities. This malaise is only strengthened by a series of foreign wars that Britain drags America into to keep together its fraying empire, including in Egypt, Ghana, and Burma. In these places, communist Russia and China aid guerrilla fighters against the Anglo-Americans. In the 1974 parliamentary elections, the reformists win power under the banner of MP Robert Kennedy, who triumphs over the old conservative and liberal parties. Prime Minister Kennedy expands civil rights and government programs, providing hope for the Commonwealth, but is shot dead by Quebecois separatists in 1979. From there follows an unstable decade. Multiple elections result in no strong majority party, while separatist movements in Quebec, California, and the reactionary South gain power and prominence. Making a deal with the devil, the new Liberty Party unites with these separatists to gain a majority in the 1988 elections. In an attempt to pull together a new decentralized constitution, they accidentally open up a Pandora's box of independence movements. One after another, the provinces vote for independence, and the Commonwealth of America nearly completely fragments apart. The British Empire does too, with most of Britain's last footholds abroad securing their independence. 
Without a unified British Empire or America, the world has entered a new multipolar phase, with local powers having mostly unrestrained authority in their own backyards. That means China, Russia, India, and the new European Confederacy all seek to replace Britain as a global superpower. The sun has set on the British Empire. Entering the present day, North America isn't doing particularly well either. The Commonwealth remains in a shrunken form, but is increasingly matched by the Republican alliance of California, Cascadia, and Texas. The South and Mississippi, two major countries, are struggling to survive in the face of growing insurrection against the government. And then there's all sorts of bizarre things happening out in Zion, where every strange religious group has set up shop. But while America is divided, the next generation increasingly sees this as a mistake. Many hope to reunify America in one form or another. What do you think would happen? Would America reunify? Would war erupt between the American states or across the world? Comment your predictions below, and if you like this sort of video, subscribe and support the channel on Patreon. All it costs is a buck a month. Thanks to user SEQ and Marklin for supporting the channel already. Adios.